I will um, give a short introduction about John Martini. Uh, well, he actually doesn't need much introduction since he's a well-known uh, member of the San Francisco Tour Guy Guild, and he's also uh, a recognized and historian, San Francisco historian. This is the fourth online presentation that he's um, giving during this uh, um, pandemic um, is this the third virtual presentation, the virtual tour for the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild. The first one uh, we uh, had the pleasure to host with John um, was um, 100 years on Alcatraz Island. It was an uh, unforgettable presentation um, in, um, in April. And then we had uh, in May, um, we had um, the Glass Palace, uh, the story, the history of uh, Sutro Bats, um, followed by um, in um, July by um, um, the 1894 uh, World's Fair, uh, the Midwinter Mid International Fair uh, in Golden Gate Park. And today, um, after you know popular demand, uh, we have another. Uh, presentation by John about uh, Playland at the Beach, uh, which uh, I'm sure that he will give us, he will show us incredible um, original uh, images, historic images and photos never seen before. Um, he will trace uh, the evolution of Playland from a uh, rough uh, neighborhood of, um, of bars and shooting galleries in the 1890s. Uh, through its golden era in the 14th, 1940s and 1950s under under the management of Whitney Brothers. And then, unfortunately, its demolition and, uh, and demise in, in 1970s. Um, so if you are ready, John, can you hear me? I'm here. Okay, perfect. If you are ready, I would say uh, that we can start the, uh, the event. We only have... 33 uh, members uh, that they have signed in. I'm sure there will be others coming um, on, you know, uh, coming in. And several, several emailed me saying that we're that we're able to make it, unfortunately, last minute. But we will record it and upload it on our uh, YouTube channel. Channel. So, um, so it's time uh, for you, John, to talk us about playing at the beach. Well, you've got it. Thanks, Roberto. Thanks for the mm -hmm. intro. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, of uh, course. So uh, I'm I'm John Martini, and uh, if uh, I haven't met you before, uh, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, grew up in the uh, what we call the western neighborhoods of San Francisco, uh, the Richmond District, the Sunset, um, West Lake, and one of the places that I went that you know all the time, uh, every kid did, was a playland at the beach. It was nearby. It was accessible by a Muni bus, you know, for 15 cents when I was a kid. It was just, you know, part of the they call the warp and woof of Western San Francisco. Friends that I knew who lived out in the Outer Avenues, you know, 46, 47th Avenue, Balboa, uh, especially on a weekend, just the sound of the crowds uh, at Playland it was just it was background sound. It was just sort of a undercurrent um, to what life was like out there. And uh, I saw it from the 1950s when I was a small kid up until I was 21 when it was torn down. So I saw its whole last years and its demise. And it's actually something I never thought that people would have so much of an interest in. Uh, but it's part of that lost San Francisco that a uh, generation that grew up after me, the newcomers to San Francisco, that they've just heard about. And here's my opportunity to share some of my childhood memories and some of what I've, I've researched and found out on my own to kind of set the scene. Uh, wait. Love this part. Aha. This is 19th century Ocean Beach in San Francisco. It was a wild, undeveloped area. 
it was really, really remote from downtown San Francisco. If you don't know San Francisco history, in a nutshell, we sort of developed from east uh, on the bay, uh, downtown San Francisco, growing westward. And uh, the last areas to be developed were actually what were called the Great Sand Dune Wastes out there. The Richmond District, the Sunset District, it was a long ways from nowhere, but it, it had an appeal, it had a destination. Uh, I've heard some folks um, say that the, the draw of the west coast of San Francisco, it actually goes back to the Ohlone people. Something just draws you. I think it's the meeting of land and, and water and vistas. Uh, it became a popular destination uh, for Europeans really during the California uh, gold rush and the years immediately afterwards. In those days, San Francisco, 1850, 1851, height of the gold rush, it was a pretty nasty uh, downtown. Uh, it was violent, it was dirty, um, and people to get out of the downtown craziness, what they would do is they'd go for long wa wagon rides, horse and buggy rides over the sand dunes, and their goal was to get out to the great ocean beach that faced on the Pacific. Uh, engravings from the 1850s and 60s show what they did once they got to the beach. Some just sat there and enjoyed the vista, but huge popular entertainment on ocean beach was racing. Um, this would be repeated in my generation when we discovered the great highway before the signals were installed it was a great place to drag race on uh, Friday and Saturday nights. Didn't know that our precursors in the 19th century were doing the same thing. Just as people today want a, a car with a lot of power, in those days you wanted a horse, a horse that ran fast, or a match set of horses and a, and a buggy. And you can't race over sand dunes too well, and you couldn't race in the downtown streets, but you got out to the beach where the sand was hard packed, and you, you could open her up. There was an entire route that evolved where people would leave downtown San Francisco, they'd make their way uh, out later Lombard Street to the Presidio, and then out through the sand dunes of uh, the Richmond District, out to the ocean beach, and they'd race up and down the beach. And along the length of the beach, enterprising uh, saloon owners set up a series of roadhouses where you could get a drink. And the earliest one on Ocean Beach was uh, 1858. It was called the Seal Rock House. This early photo of Seal Rock House, well, okay, let me back up a sec. The background gives you a view of, of what San Francisco's Western neighborhoods looked like in the 1850s. It looks like the Sahara Desert. Getting out here took a lot of effort. And the people that came out here, generally they had money. Um, this is the view looking from uh, the Cliff House down towards Ocean Beach. That little building there is called Seal Rock House, roughly at the corner of Balboa and, and Great Highway. They named these roadhouses after geographic features down at uh, Lake Merced, which was one of the stops on, on the route, you had Lake House. And then you had, uh, right down near what's the zoo today, you had Ocean House. And here you had Seal Rock House, looking at Seal Rocks. And perhaps the most famous of these roadhouses that was built was on the furthest west promontory of the cliffs. And it was called the Cliff House. 1863, it opens in July, just about the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Interestingly, the Cliff House uh, historians had never been able to find an exact opening date for the Cliff House. It was just, didn't even merit coverage in the newspapers. But they're advertising, they're in business by July of 1863. They've been in business there, open and shut for various reasons, uh, currently closed due to the pandemic. But uh, since 1863, that's considered to be the probably the longest operating in the same location, uh, restaurant bar in San Francisco. Now it's burned down a couple of times and it blew up once, but the Cliff House, it survived. It survived uh, because of the people that were coming. And uh, coming back to this, it was a trek to get out there. Uh, it took some money 
there was no public transportation. There's no muni in those days. Uh, when the Cliff House was built, to get people out there, they built a road roughly down on South Geary Street, but it cost uh, a dollar each way to drive a wagon on the road. Uh, multiply that times about 20. So that's a $40 round trip in today's money to go to the Cliff House. The people that were going out were people with money, uh, what they used to call the swells or the sports. And it became, became uh, such a destination that the general working public you know, wanted to see it, but had very little chance to get out there until 1883. And in that year, uh, it's hard to tell in this photo, but that's a train depot on Ocean Beach. And there's a train. Uh, you can see the smoke coming out behind that fence. That was the uh, Park and Ocean Railroad. It was a steam train started at the corner of Haight Street and Stanyon, and uh, it cost 10 cents, but it carried you all the way from Haight and Stanyon the whole length of uh, Golden Gate Park on the south side and uh, terminated. And it was across the street from what's now the, the, the Safeway down near the Ocean Beach. In the background, a little embryonic cliff house just to the left. This was the first time the public could get out there. Uh, I mean, Joe Blow, blue collar. And the day it opened, I was just reading about it before the talk, the day it opened in uh, December of 1883, 15,000 people rode just on that first day. There had never been crowds like that on Ocean Beach before. And when he got out there, there was really only one destination to go to, and that was uh, the Cliff House. And within, it seems, within minutes of the train uh, going into business, a uh, rugged collection of shacks and tents and uh, lean-tos sprung up in the vicinity of the little depot. And what was going on there? They were selling liquor. They were gambling. They were selling overpriced uh, ham and eggs. They were pa uh, selling what passed uh, in those days for coffee. The reviews were, it was just miserable dreck. But they were uh, making money off of the new people, the first visitors coming to Ocean Beach. Uh, enterprising guy by the name of Mooney set this up. Uh, there's a whole saga behind it, but essentially, Mr. Mooney and all the other people that were with him, they claimed that the land uh, on the beach was not part of the city of San Francisco, and they set up their own independent uh, city called Mooneysville with their own mayor, and it was lawless. Uh, and it was pretty terrifying to walk down the street. It was probably like a, a mini version of one of the Old West uh, mining camps. It lasted all of two months before the city said, okay, that's enough. You know, we're moving you out. And they gave everybody one day's notice and they just knocked it down. Uh, it, but it was the precursor of what was going to be happening. That area, that end of the line for the streetcar, it was a focal point. It was a destination, a place where over the years, a variety of attractions were going to grow up through the middle of the 20th century. Later that same uh, year, a little bit more sedate, this large edifice was erected. This is right on the corner of, of uh, Balboa and Great Highway. To get you located, uh, you're looking kind of south on Great Highway. That building was called the Ocean Beach Pavilion with little mansard. Uh, turrets. And to the left of it, oh, look at that. There's that old seal rock house that went back to the 1850s. It's amazing how long some of these buildings lasted here. Color postcard at the turn of the century. But what was the Ocean Beach Pavilion? It, it was a big hall you could rent out. Uh, it was a great place for having uh, weddings or for having balls or for having large um, uh, uh, meetings. But they also had smaller meeting rooms. They had a restaurant, they had a bar attached, uh, and the old Seal Rock, Hotel, uh, Seal Rock House was Seal Rock Hotel. So you could go out to the beach, spend the night, party. It was becoming a real destination. And although Mooneysville was gone, the neighborhood kept sprouting these attractions. Anything that, that could separate people coming on the train from their nickels. Uh, this photo just recently turned up in a, in a wonderful photo collection, belonged to the great historian Marilyn Blaisdell, 
took a while to locate it, but this is the foot of Balboa Street. Uh, Balboa Street and the, up there, there's a little uh, wood boardwalk kind of angling into the distance. And then it says uh, Seal Rock Gallery in the background. Seal Rock Gallery was a photo gallery, got tin type photos. You're looking at the corner of what's now uh, La Playa and Balboa Street. There's chop houses, there's shooting galleries, there's a tin type gallery. Uh, that panorama of the world, that was a series of those like uh, uh, drop a nickel in and the uh, what do you call, uh, the cards flip by, the stereo viewers. It would later uh, get transplanted up to Sutro Bath, but all these things had in common was they were independently operated. Uh, whoever owned the land out there uh, simply rented space to them. There was no management. These things would spring up, they'd go down. Uh, they uh, were generally pretty low cost because the clientele they were trying to attract. By 1912, looking down from the Sutro Heights onto Ocean Beach, you can see they drew a big crowd even uh, in the 1910s. Get you located over on your left at the extreme left, there's the Ocean Beach Pavilion. The smokestack belongs to a pump house. There was a pump house where they sucked water by means of that long pier extending out. They, uh, uh, that was called the Lurleen Baths Pump House. They sucked salt water and actually pumped it all the way down to Polk Street where there was the Lurleen Baths uh, swimming pools. Salt water bathing was very popular. The two uh, windmills in the background, Golden Gate Park. This is where Playland is going to be. It's not there yet. Down there over by the old Ocean Beach Pavilion, there's a cluster of buildings we know from the old city directories. It was the same thing, uh, very much as what I showed you in the previous photo. Different operators, different buildings, but there were a couple of uh, restaurants down there. There was a tavern. There was a, a sort of a coffee and cafe called the Cycler's Rest where bicyclists could stop. But in 1912, things are gonna kick off. Everyone probably heard of the big 1915 World's Fair that happened in San Francisco. Well, it was originally supposed to happen in Golden Gate Park uh, when the fair was first announced. In fact, ground was broken in the polo grounds for the 1915 World's Fair. And the thinking was, hey, let's, uh, do some, get real estate near the west end of Golden Gate Park because the fair is going to be there. Well, fair didn't end up there, but a lot of concessions opened up on Ocean Beach in anticipation of the fair that never happened. One of the first ones that was built was Loof's Hippodrome. What in God's name is a hippodrome? A hippodrome is a, a building that held horse races, or in this case, merry-go-round. Inside Loof's Hippodrome was one of the finest carousels ever built, the, the Loof's Hippodrome. It had 68 horses. Yeah, I got it. 68 horses, a uh, organ that cost somewhere north of $100,000, just an astounding amount of money in its time. And uh, it had already traveled a bit. It, it had been built in 1906 and in 1907 it was up in Seattle at a place called Luna Park. That was destroyed by fire, but the carousel survived and uh, Mr. Loof relocated it to Ocean Beach. Right next to uh, Mr. Loof's carousel, there was a, something called Babyland. Babyland was two concessions. You've seen them all if you've ever been to a county fair. One is where you throw a baseball at the little stuffed um, critters or, or stuffed babies, you try to knock them down to win a prize. Next to it was a shooting gallery where you shot 22 uh, rounds at little moving tin targets. This is really the embryo of what's going to become Playland at the beach, although no one was calling it Playland in those days. It was uh, either called, you know, Loofs or sometimes it was called uh, Loofs at the sea. Sometimes it was just the beach. When things really started to kick off was the following year. Why? Muni, for the first time, 
uh, Muni, the municipal railway, the uh, People's Railroad, it reached Ocean Beach. And the foreground in this photo is one of the B line uh, streetcars. Ran from the ferry building all the way out uh, Geary Street and finally made its way to the foot of Cabrillo Street when there was a turnaround. It's always a genesis when you have a streetcar, things spring up at the end of it. We'd already seen that with Mooneysville at the end of the Ferries and Ocean, which was a private line. This was a public one. Transfers were given. And right away, more and more people, based on the popularity of Loof's Hippodrome and Babyland, one of the things started to, to pop up. Uh, little embryonic uh, roller coasters. They used to call them scenic railways. And you started to uh, see things as uh, circle swings. And I'm going to diverge for a second and stop talking about Playland because this, these sites always get confused. And I should explain. What are we looking at here? This is Sutro Baths. I did a whole separate talk on the Sutro Baths that was not aligned with Playland at the beach at all. The only thing that Sutro Baths and Playland had was the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Playland uh, doesn't, doesn't really get started till the 1910s. Sutro Baths went back to the 1890s and they attracted a totally different clientele. Sutro Baths was attracting people that wanted to go swimming or they wanted to come and watch the vaudeville entertainment that was, was uh, free or the concerts. People that were going to uh, the beach, they wanted they wanted to spend nickels. They wanted to play games of chance. They wanted to go on rides. So many people just make a day of it. Go both down to the beach and then go up to Sutro's. But back to the beach, by the early 1920s, it was really heavily developed. There's our old building, the Ocean Beach Pavilion in the center and to the left the attractions they just drift off the page there were so many of them there's a ride called over the falls and then further down you can see there's a, a bit of a, one of the roller coasters all independently owned and operated but there was now a management company uh, those two guys Loof and Friedel they became the landlords if you will to all these attractions, uh, literally dozens of them. And the, some of them were kind of seedy. Uh, some of them were very much on the up and up. There was always been an, an edginess uh, to Playland. And definitely in these days, uh, it was there. Uh, you look at the, the old photos, the crowds are there. It's kind of scungy around the edges. Uh, the, not all the rides are really as well maintained as as you might, and maybe that's the attraction that the carnivals have, that seaside attractions have. There's a little edginess to them. Not that anything's dangerous, but there's a little error there, just a little feeling. And the main entrance, Shoots, that was the name that stuck. Uh, Shoots at the beach. The name. Uh, Friedel's at the beach, or, or one of them was simply called Attractions at the Beach. No, it was either the beach or later on Shoots. But why Shoots? The prime attraction, the big one that went up in 1921, was a Shoot the Shoots ride. Very much uh, like today, if you go down to any number of amusement parks and they have a log ride where you sit in a plastic hollowed out log and it, uh, you get dragged up a, uh, by a chain drive up a high incline and then you bob along for a while on the lazy river and then all of a sudden you drop and uh, you, terrifying and pick up speed and then you plunge head first into a pool of water. That's a shoots ride, shoot the shoots. And that dominated the northern half of the amusement park uh, it, it was it towered over everything else. And now we're starting to look like a real amusement park, not only in mass and scale, but also in the area. Uh, Loof and Friedel, their shoots at the beach, it uh, encompassed everything from uh, Balboa Street all the way down to Fulton. 
But this was the big draw. This made San Francisco the big time. It was the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper roller coaster, it was built by the same folks that built what's called the Giant Dipper down at Santa Cruz Boardwalk, which is still standing, still going. Ours, the Big Dipper, was even bigger than the one down at Santa Cruz. It was an entire city block long. It had a 70 foot drop to it. And uh, it seems pretty amazing to me, but the ride took a minute and a half. Once you have a roller coaster, and once you have a shoot the shoots, uh, you're home. This, this was the destination. People from the, all over the Bay Area, they'd head for the beach, they'd head for the shoots. Top of the ride on the, on the Big Dipper. You look at the upper left-hand corner, the funny looking lookout tower, that's a Sutro Heights, just above the Cliff House. All this area today, there, there, there's a, not a single thing in this photograph that has survived from 1922, amazingly enough. Color view, looking down. By this time, the beach has become more um, tamed. Beaches got the, the seawall and the esplanade and the great highway here lined with cars. And then across the street, shoots at the beach. Why did I pick 1926? Didn't make any difference to people going to the beach, but it does for us for our history. The earliest incarnation of Playland had been those uh, attractions of uh, Mooneysville, and then later the shooting galleries at the foot of Balboa, right at the turn of the 20th century. And then in the 1910s, the, the uh, Loof and Friedel shoots attractions. In 1926, a couple of brothers by the name of the Whitneys, George and Leo, they become managers for Loof and Friedel. And before long, they buy them out. They start buying up everything. And one of the first things they do is they rename Shoots at the Beach, Playland at the Beach, as indication of the new management. And the difference was while Shoots at the Beach had pretty much been a conglomeration of what could have been, you know, uh, carny acts and uh, games of chance and independently run rides, underneath the Whitney's, they owned everything. Uh, the barker that was sitting there asking you to, you know, throw darts at balloons and win a prize. He wasn't independent anymore. He was an employee of the Whitney brothers. They could maintain quite a bit of control. They could uh, maintain uh, quality and ensure more safety, more professionalism. And then they went on. And in the 1930s, they went on to buy the land underneath. So they really built themselves a seaside empire. By the 1930s, there were uh, 14 different major rides. There were 20 different uh, concessions. If I hesitate, it's because they kept changing the number of concessions. They'd come, they'd go, they'd open, they'd close, they'd be combined. And they also had four different restaurants. So it was pretty much a go and enterprise. The name Shoot the Shoots, well, the Shoots ride continued. It's just, it was now called Playland at the beach, and the Shoots uh, was one of the attractions. Publicity photo, they're uh, trying to show, this, this is very modern. This is, this is 1930s. This isn't uh, people wearing you know, wool bathing costumes down to their ankles. This is you know, modern California evolving. And Playland is starting to become recognizably the uh, playland that those of us who go back far enough can remember it looking like clustered up alongside ocean beach great highway cliff house in the distance street cars and buses at the turnaround at the foot of cabrillo street only thing that's really different is uh, uh, the clothes and the cars otherwise the crowds the same what would you do at playland you went on rides you went, uh, you, you played games of uh, skill and chance, like a ski ball. You went on what were called dark rides. A dark ride is a ride where you get in a car, and sometimes they're called Tunnel of Love, and you 
disappear through a pair of swinging doors and go through a blackened maze and come out at the other end. Several of those at Playland. And the uh, uh, Whitney's, they did something. They wanted to attract everybody, all ages. And they tried to make it family friendly. Uh, of course, the big rides were aimed at the big kids, the adults, like these folks about to start out on the Big Dipper. And then he had kiddie rides, the classic uh, auto on a track pulled by a chain going endlessly in circles. And with it, but I found out when I was small, a steering wheel that doesn't do anything, but it gives you a sense of control. And this is where my mother and my grandmother uh, basically spent the entire day when we'd go to Playland at the beach playing games of chance. Mom, mom wasn't a pinball player, no, no. But in the background, it was a, a game called Fascination. Simple, you just rolled a small rubber ball underneath the uh, glass panel and tried to get them to line up in holes drilled in the plywood. And if you line them up, you won a prize. Between that and skee ball, you, you could, it's amazing how much money these things ate and how quickly. And what was the payoff? Oh, I don't know, a, a paper mache horse, a uh, locket made out of plastic, painted gilt. The profit from this, this was huge. This is where the money really comes from at these attractions. I learned from talking to people, the last manager at Playland, it's food and it's, it's the games of luck and the games of chance. And of course, when the been a amusement park, if they didn't have high tone gifts like you know, these tin types, memory of visiting Playland at the beach. Food, I mentioned food. There were four different full restaurants uh, at Playland, and there were any number of places where you could get a walk away cone or a hot dog uh, on a stick. One of the most famous ones was uh, the uh, It's It up there on the upper left. It's It, if you've never had one, it's a uh, made in San Francisco concoction. In its original form, it was two big oatmeal cookies. Uh, sandwiching a slab of vanilla ice cream and then the whole thing was uh, dipped in chocolate and it was frozen they uh did, guaranteed to make you diabetic if you aren't already one these things were you know wildly popular and you can still buy them at, at the i think safeway sells them uh they've changed the formula somewhat over the years but and it's it uh hot dogs the, the hot house to the left in that upper photo uh, that's what uh, passed for ethnic food, by the way, uh, Mexican. Uh, the lower one, National Ice Cream down there, the hamburger stand, it's run by one of the many Greek families. Uh, traditionally, there at Ocean Beach and up at the Cliff House, it was uh, Greek Americans who ran the food concessions. Uh, the tradition continues even today up at the Cliff House, where the Hontalas family, going back, I think, four generations now, running food concessions out at the Playland Cliff House area. There was no liquor on the Midway, but across the street, uh, this is across the street on uh, La Playa from Playland, this little funky bar called the Gables. This is where you, this is where you could get a drink. Uh, turned into a neighborhood tavern that just continued on for years. One of the last vestiges of Playland had disappeared. The very large building that Ocean Beach Pavilion that went back to the 1880s, it kept getting reinvented. And in 1929, the Whitney's turned it into what's called a Topsy's Roost. Topsy's Roost, it was you know, unabashedly uh, racist in its themes. It was based on the uh, kind of ragamuffin kid named Topsy from Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she was their mascot. And the big thing was it's old chicken dinners. Uh, you get a chicken dinner for a few bucks, uh, half a chicken was 50 cents, a full chicken was a dollar. Uh, there was dining, there was dancing, and sort of thematic with places uh, like you know, the, the Cotton Club in New York. The clientele was white, the staff was black. Um, it featured jazz. Uh, they had dancing. They probably remember the 1929 is the Depression, and it's also Prohibition. Um, you could probably get a splash in your coffee cup of something that 
yeah, it was illegal. But it was the 20s, it was San Francisco. The slides, that was one of the gizmos, uh, topsies, is you ate upstairs, you wanted to go dancing, didn't go down the stairs, you slid down to the dance floor. Topsies would continue on for a couple of decades in that location there. Uh, again, Balboa, Great Highway. Color photography comes in and you start to get an idea. Of, they weren't subtle at Playland, it was garish. Things were designed in, in vivid colors. They wanted to catch the eye. They also wanted to, especially out there in the foggy, the overcast western parts of the city, give a, give a shot of color. This one here, this was the Hot House restaurant that I mentioned earlier. I used to go you know, to these places when I was a kid, and it's funny how you know, when you're five, six, seven years old, you have a, your, your mind is reaching, trying to make sense of things. And here's a restaurant and upstairs, what looks like a Pueblo. I wasn't sure if maybe it wasn't staff housing. If that isn't maybe where the, uh, the cooks and the waitress lived when they were, you know, weren't making tamales. Um, no, no, it's all false work. Uh, but um, it, maybe that's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to excite the interest of little kids. What's going on? What's up there? I got to explore. A place where you could spend the entire day was the Fun House. Opened uh, not too long after Big Dipper roller coaster. Originally, it was called the Bug House. Bug House, of course, is a name for a, uh, an institution for mentally disturbed people. And uh, later on, uh, I, I guess maybe even back then, Bug House was a little bit too much of a name for, for a big building full of uh, attractions and rides. It became the Fun House. One of the many landmarks that sticks in people's minds, especially if they were there, is the Fun House. For a 10 cents admission, you could be turned loose inside. Oh man, I, the number of things you could do, very, uh, varying lengths slides. One of them was a three story tall slide. Uh, he rode down on a gunny sack reaching absolutely terrifying speeds uh, before you came to an end at the ground floor and got back in line to hike back up and do it all over again. They had one of the rotating turntables, lower left, and it spun like a record platter. Uh, that's where you learned about centrifugal force and uh, its effect. The only place that you didn't get thrown off that thing was if you were the first person who got dead center. You had the barrel roll. Uh, you had coin-operated arcades, and the whole inside, it was supposed to be jovial. I actually found it really creepy. The, the clown heads, the aging attractions in the 1950s, I don't think they'd upgraded a lot of, of the games for 25, 30 years. Again, there was that edginess feel to it. I think that's why you find several uh, horror movies uh, that have been made uh, use variations of the funhouse for the setting. World War II, according to the management there, the, the Whitney brothers, this is when they did their best uh, times. Uh, the San Francisco and the Bay Area was flooded with military personnel. And because Playland had a reputation for being clean operation and there was no liquor served on the Midway proper, it was heavily endorsed as a destination for service people to go. And um, uh, I read that they had 750,000 people ride the Big Dipper in uh, 1943. Uh, that shows you how many people were coming to Playland. And in this photo here, if you were to enlarge it, you can go in endlessly. There's, uh, it seemed to be Sailor Day. There are uh, probably half the crowd are wearing uh, sailor jumpers, and what are they there? They're they're looking for girls. They're uh, getting walk away hot dogs. They're at the shooting galleries. It was good. It was clean, and it was a place where you could spend some time before you shipped out. To be frank, uh, it was the military was so uh, I don't want to say um, they're grateful, but they were so supportive of Playland and, and what they were doing, the opportunities they gave that the, the army threatened to shut Playland down 
not as an attraction, but because of the lights. Uh, they were as afraid early in World War II that Japanese submarines might be able to use all the lights on the, the midway uh, as aiming points if they were going to attack San Francisco. And the military simultaneously said, but we're going to help you. And uh, according to lore, they sent out crews of military personnel to paint out the lights on the side facing the ocean. Um, now, that's a lot of light bulbs, but you know, I'll go with it. Uh, it's one of those things that so many people insist that the military held, the term was uh, not dumbed down, but dull down Flayland during the war. There's got to be some legs to it. Following the war was really the, the height of uh, Playland at the beach, the height of the cliff house, the height of the whole development out there. In this aerial photo, we, we've dated to uh, 1948. You can see the extent of what the Whitney's controlled. The Big Dipper is at the very bottom of your picture. So you've got one, two, three, four, five complete city blocks that were owned by the Whitney's, covered with rides and attractions. Uh, the, the center right, that's that's the uh, Chutes ride. And just above it, you can see the big uh, casino building or the pavilion building that Topsy's was in. And at the very top is the Cliff House. The Whitney's owned the Cliff House. Uh, they purchased it at a rock bottom price in 1936 from the old Sutro estate. So they owned everything from this, essentially Golden Gate Park to Seal Rocks. It was all Whitney's. And George Whitney, who was really the, the brains and the mover of the two, the two brothers, uh, they called him uh, in uh, Look Magazine, they called him the P.T. Barnum of the West Coast. And that was a good description. Always reinventing. Playland was always putting in new attractions or giving a facelift to old existing ones. Uh, one thing I learned was that the Whitney's were always looking for a good investment, a good price, and looking for things at, uh, at a bargain basement uh, price, if you could get them. After the 1939-1940 World's Fair that was held out on Treasure Island, they bought a couple of attractions that were out there and were popular, like the Something called the diving bell erupting at, at dead center. More on that later. They uh, also found that some of the rides were aging. For example, the big famous uh, Shoot the Shoots. Um, it wasn't as popular as it once was, and they realized the amount of square footage it took up. They could put a, a number of other newer attractions, maybe get a whole new crowd of people coming in. So the Shoots came down in 1950, and the Diving Bell, uh, Dark Mystery, uh, Skylark, other rides took its place. Rather than devoting, it, it all comes into nickels and dimes. Rather than devoting half a city block to one ride that could maybe carry uh, you know, a dozen people in the car, uh, the little shooting shoots uh, boat at a time, here you've got a number of attractions turning people over, making nickels, making dimes. The B Streetcar. This it had really spurred the development of Playland when it started running in 1913, and Playland was really and truly is a, a streetcar destination. Uh, around the United States, you, you'd find it was very common at the end of a new streetcar line that they would build an amusement park, a destination. You get riders on the streetcars, and everybody makes out like a bandit. The people that run the amusement park. The uh, streetcar companies, now, the B line in San Francisco, it was uh, eventually uh, additional city trolley buses and diesel buses all feeding down to Playland. But something else is happening too. After World War II, America had a bounce back, an economic growth uh, for about 10 years that made automobiles affordable to the masses. This is about 1950, just a sea of cars, post-war production, and simultaneously, new highways are going in. That was 1950s was the era of the freeway and the superhighway. California uh, Department of Transportation 
And Playland is starting to maybe show its age a little bit. And you had people making a decision if it's going to be a long weekend coming up. Huh. Do we want to take the streetcar down to Playland or do we want to hop in our Nash and drive down to Santa Cruz? So Playland has to start competing with other destinations. One of the famous things, if you're a movie buff, about Playland is that it featured prominently in the closing scenes of the movie Lady from Shanghai, the Orson Welles 1947 movie. And the climactic final scene, which is a shootout in the House of Mirrors, amazing photography, it was, well, it wasn't actually filmed at Playland. It was laid at Playland, but the top two photos, those, that's a Hollywood soundstage. Only the last few uh, seconds of the movie, after the climactic shootout, when Orson Welles' character exits the funhouse, do you see the real Playland? It's kind of interesting to see how the set designers at Upper Left, when they created the crazy house and Midway, they used a lot of the architectural details from the real funhouse when they were doing their set, even down to having the roller coaster in the background of the Hollywood set. Kind of funny though that they uh, didn't pick up on things like fun and called it the crazy house instead. Hey, it's a movie, who's gonna notice? The 1950s and the 1960s, for lack of anything else, I call these the cusp years because Playland went from its sort of zenith, uh, post-World uh, War II, to uh, the realities of the 1960s and declining attendance and aging infrastructure. On a nice weekend, the place would be jammed as always. You know, thousands of people coming and walking the midway, getting something to eat, just watching the show. But on a weekday, uh, like the Express is, you could fire a cannon down the midway and not hit everybody. But this is, this is the period that uh, the boomers, my generation, that we remember about Playland. It was in the 50s and 60s, uh, early 60s, it was still a place where you could go and uh, you could drop your kids off, uh, give them a pocket full of quarters and see you later. It was safe, relatively. Uh, there was a lot of uh, activity going on, a lot of things to catch a young person's attention. But at the same time, when, when we were there, we, we could see they was getting a little, little frayed around the edges. What uh, was going to end up happening was that times were going to take their toll on Playland. They started to pare back. They uh, removed a number of the attractions that weren't making money. And they brought in a series of portable rides, the type of thing you'd actually see set up at a carnival. And they would set these up on the on the vacant lot that's now occupied by the Safeway. That was part of the Playland property. That was a series of, uh, I can only call them carny rides, ever-changing uh, miniature roller coasters. Uh, there were real miniature race cars on a, on a controlled uh, route that was lined with rubber tires. Anything, keep the kids coming. And something that, by if he brought in a concessionaire with his with his own uh, dark ride he could set up, one less thing the Whitney's would have to pay for. 1960s, this was a uh, one price ticket, uh, 15 different rides you could go on at that time. Uh, it, it was still an impressive, it was still a good way to spend the day, but you had 15 different uh, rides and concessions. That's on from about 100. Uh, in 1920, when I won't say that Playland was at its height, but when the shoots was at its most extensive. Again, the iconic, the, the Big Dipper. Uh, this photograph came up recently too. I love this one because it shows how big this thing was. Uh, extending that, that's Fulton Street at the right and uh, Cabrillo Street at upper left. And it takes up, uh, probably about 40% of that 
of that city block area. That's a lot of space. And it was losing money. It was not drawing as many people as it once had by the 50s. And in 1955, believe it or not, they tore down the Big Dipper roller coaster. Uh, in retrospect, it's like, that was so iconic. Uh, what's this amusement park without a roller coaster? Well, they found out. It tears the heart out of your amusement park. What the Whitney's thinking was, if they were to get rid of that 40% of a city block roller coaster, think of all the other attractions you could build on that valuable real estate. Well, that's what they did. Uh, the, the Big Dipper had had some challenges over the years maintaining it in the salt environment. Probably, literally, you're a block and a half away from the Pacific Ocean had always been a challenge. And uh, there had been a couple of injuries, people riding and one woman fell off, injured herself badly. Uh, there was during 1943, uh, a sailor on leave got a little bit too carried away. And you always see the sign saying, you know, don't stand up. Well, he stood up and he was killed in the accident. Uh, the inquest found that he was at fault, but you know, the reputation, well, by the time I heard about it when I was a kid, his uh, head had uh, flown off and it had uh, you know, landed on the midway and uh, none, none of it was true, but the lore of the, of the long vanished roller coaster continued. The diving bell was one of the attractions that had been at the 1939-1940 World's Fair that the Whitney's had picked up at a, at a good price post-fair. And uh, the woman at lower left is holding a shark by the tail, the PR photo. The whole idea of the diving bell was you submerged into the uh, depths of the ocean in a controlled environment. And uh, you went down, you had no idea how far, and you'd look at it and see sea life swimming around. Well, they couldn't keep the fish alive. They kept stocking the thing, and it was in a pool of, of salt water. Fish kept dying. So by the time its last years, it had turned more into a thrill ride. They found out that when you went down in the diving bell, it, you're only about four feet underwater, actually, but it was pressurized. And if you released the brakes, the thing came to the surface like a cork in an explosion of water. Um, any fish that had uh, you know, managed to survive in the depths were probably, you know, ground to bits by the the effect of this thing rocketing out of the water for, for uh, the better part of 10 years. The giant camera, there were two sites. The giant camera was one of them that I call outposts of uh, Playland because the giant camera wasn't in Playland. It was behind the Cliff House. It was constructed 1949, 1950, when the Cliff House was uh, remodeled by the Whitney's and it was supposed to look like, you know, a big camera. And you'll see in a little bit, it, it's still there. It was a, um, they called these things a duck architecture because in honor of the architectural themes that happened in the 1930s where if you had an orange uh, juice stand in Southern California, you built a giant orange uh, to, in, if you had, uh, if you were uh, selling artichokes, you built a giant artichoke and you sold artichokes. Uh, duck architecture, the camera obscura uh, in its original shape here is designed to look more like the bridge of a ship. Later on, we'll see it's uh, going to get another makeover. Sky tram, another outpost of Playland at the beach. It was an aerial tram that ran from the cliff house to Point Lobos and back again at, at, at a terrifyingly slow speed. You're suspended over the breakers for a couple of minutes while this thing slowly chugged along. It only carried about 20 passengers, never really made a lot of money. What you usually do in a case like that is you cycle the uh, ride for something else or you repurpose it. SkyTram could only do one thing, go back and forth, back and forth. And it did only lasted about 10 years. But the SkyTram and this next one, Frontier Town, these were part of what we call a cross-pollinization between, of all places, Disneyland and Playland. When Walt Disney decided to build his amusement park in the mid-1950s, 
he had a whole bunch of great people coming up with ideas for Cinderella's Castle and Jungle Boat Rides and Tomorrowland. What he didn't have was he didn't have the know-how on staff of how do you actually run an amusement park? How do you deal with, with ticketing? Uh, how many restrooms do you need? Um, how do you handle uh, discipline of, of staff and training of staff? So Disney's people came up and they met extensively with the Whitney family. And they actually hired uh, George Whitney Jr., uh, the son of the George Whitney who uh, really started uh, Playland. And George Whitney Jr. went down and <clears throat> helped develop Disneyland. Out of Disneyland, uh, they brought ideas back and they used them at Playland. The Sky Tram was one of the things that came out of uh, the Disneyland idea. Disneyland, uh, in its original form, had these little overhead uh, eggs suspended from uh, cables that uh, took you around the park. Um, the Sky Tram was a little bit more elegant version of that. Carried about 20 passengers. Frontier Town, pretty much a, a, a direct ripoff of uh, Adventureland down in Southern California with you know, miniature train, antique cars, uh, Western theme. Sure, again, keep, keep Playland fresh. In doing research, one thing I've found is how these places evolved, how they changed over the years. Really quickly, the Ocean Beach Pavilion, it just kept soldiering on one use after another. How it looked in the uh, 1890s, how it looked as a place called Hawaii Land in the 1920s. Barnum's at the Beach by 1950. And then on its last legs, just before it was demolished, when it had last uh, served as a, a rock concert hall called Family Dog on, on the Great Highway. Get to the uh, later part of the 1960s. It's really starting to show its age. Uh, there, the, the crowds were down. There were uh, shuttered attractions along the midway. There were days when staff outnumbered visitors, especially on a, on a foggy day or a cold, rainy winter day. In fact, uh, they just sometimes shut Playland down for the season in the middle of winter, just what, worth keeping the staff on. And uh, a rough element started to show up. Um, this picture was actually taken in the 50s, early bikers coming down. And I don't think I'd want to mix it up with, with them at any point. Uh, these, these were not comic book characters. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the Wild One era bikers, uh, serious stuff. And in the 1960s, Playland began to have problems with kids, with uh, uh, racial violence, you know, white kids fighting black kids, and Playland, it went downhill. Crowds from the 1940s and World War II evolved into 1970s schlock. Um, just a few restaurants open. The big hit to the Playland was uh, actually in 1958 when George Whitney, the, the, the scion of the family, he died in 1958. And the family just was not able to run Playland at the same level that he had always envisioned it. Uh, they brought in new partners. They started to let concessions out to individuals again, rather than maintaining the tight family control. But one thing that kept working in this 1970s photo was food service. You could always go down to Playland and there were always different places you could get coffee or food or bull pups. And the surfboards are an indication of the changing clientele. Ocean Beach and Playland were becoming uh, more of a surfer community. Press photographer went out. It was said that the last uh, summer of operation it was announced was going to be the summer of 1972. There were other plans for Playland. And it was just, it was sad. The end came in that summer of 1972. It had been talked about for years, but the place was going to be sold. A developer with the unique name of Jeremy Etzhoken, he was going to buy the entire Playland site 
and he was going to develop it as condominiums. Uh, people in San Francisco, the reaction was sort of, well, we're going to miss Playland, but it hasn't been the same for years. Isn't like uh, they tore the heart out of uh, the beating, wonderful attraction of the 1940s Playland at the end. It was, it was sad. Uh, it closed the day after Labor Day weekend, 1972, September 5th. That was the day that uh, they shuttered everything, and demolition began almost immediately. What they did was uh, just throw up sawhorses. I'm, uh, I've been around safety and planning long enough that this is not how you handle a construction site. There's no fencing. Uh, you just wandered in, and believe me, kids from all over San Francisco wandered around, and they walked off with amazing bits and pieces of architecture and, and signs. That's why there's so much Playland memorabilia that, that's still out there. It surfaces on, on eBay and in, in private collections. A lot of it was, I think we use the term liberated. And there were some surprises. I mentioned earlier in the 1880s, a, a pump house had been built to pump water out of Pacific Ocean over the hill to downtown San Francisco for the Lurleen Baths. The pump house still existed. It had just been engulfed by Whitney era construction of pie shops and it's it stands. And as they were tearing down the lumber, they hit this uh, impenetrable brick structure and it turned out to be the pump house um, at lower left, or uh, there it is. Uh, and all the historians went down and went, oh my God, it survived. Look at it, it's still got the original lettering on the side, you know, Bush and Larkin, that's where the Lurleen Baths were. Isn't that amazing? And then it was torn down. And Mr. Ed's Hoken, uh, he ran out of money. Everything fell through. They got Playland down and no condominiums. The whole project just came to a screeching halt. And for 12 years, from 1972 to 1984, it looked pretty much like at lower left, it was just a sand dune waste. In my research, I found something that it's kind of heartbreaking, which is that Ocean Beach and Land's End, Fort Funston are all old National Park Service land now. They're preserved as Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Well, briefly, the National Park Service in about 1970, when the park was being planned by Congress, they uh, looked at Playland because the word was Playland was going to close. Could that have been purchased and made as a greenbelt open space? And almost immediately they realized, oh no, this developer has all this money and it's going to be condominiums. We're not even going to waste our time evaluating it for possible parkland. Had they put it within the legislated boundary of GGNRA after 1972, that those uh, one tooth, those four uh, city blocks could have been part of a National Park Service open space. Series of aerial photos, how the place evolved, how it's changed. 1969, Playland is uh, still going. Uh, it's, it's wobbly, but it's going. If you look in dead center, that sort of uh, fish hook shape, that's the, the turnaround for the Muni buses at the foot of Cabrillo. And the next photo, Following demolition, the empty dunes, uh, now a, a Safeway has taken the place of what was uh, one of the back lots at Playland, the Safeway that's still standing. And in 2019, when this photo was taken, finally, another developer came in and in three different uh, phases, constructed condominiums on the land that Ed's Hoken had uh, purchased and never been able to develop. The first ones that were built were the ones on the right facing the ocean, those were 1984. The second section, a little denser, that was a, on the left, that was a 1990. And behind on the other side of Balboa Street, a couple of years after that, even more housing. From the Cliff House, 1946, and today. So, Two landmarks have survived. There's a little apartment house at, on the hill at the far left, and of course, the windmill in Golden Gate Park. Oh, I guess, and the seawall and the timeless beach. 
another comparison. Uh, after Orson Welles leaves the real fun house in the last minutes of the lady from Shanghai, the camera pans across Cabrillo Street uh, towards the, at that time, uh, shuttered for the season playlands, how they were able to film the shot in the off season. And same view today. That little red arrow at lower right points to the same apartment house that's in both views. There are vestiges of Playland that have survived. Um, part of it uh, is nostalgia. Part of it is just ongoing economic viability. Uh, there was actually briefly a place that called itself Playland, not at the beach, located over in El Cerrito. And uh, they had a bunch of that liberated material that had come out of Playland placards and signs, and they had uh, some of the animatronics. They also had dioramas that were built by people that loved Playland, recreating, uh, you know, in, in miniature what Playland had looked like. And unfortunately, you got to do this. They went out of business in 2018, just like Playland. They couldn't make it either. What they were uh, tr trying to do was bring in groups to have uh, parties uh, using the Playland theme as, as a backdrop. Laughing Sal, more about her in a second. She was a fixture in the fun house and uh, she, her cackling could be heard all over the midway. Like I said, that sound of Playland at the beach uh, wafted all over the outside lands. The cackling of uh, Laughing Sal was traumatic that, from I think 10 a.m. to uh, eight at night, endlessly on a loop the Musée Mechanique, and then uh, the It's It, like I mentioned, It's It's, still going, still available. And one of my favorites is, is the Louvre Carousel. A lot of the fixtures and fittings of Playland, they were sold at auction. Some of the rides were sold at auction, and the famous Louvre Carousel that, that had been like the anchor was back to 1912. It was sold to a private collector and put into storage. And then eventually it ended up uh, being relocated down to Long Beach, California, where it was part of the, uh, let's see, Shoreline Village Amusement Park. It was there from 1983 till 1998 when it was purchased once again, and it was brought back to San Francisco. And it's today down in the Yerba Buena Gardens. Go see it, the same carousel. Had to be repainted and restored. Um, kids and merry go round horses, they uh, the horses take a lot of beating, a lot of abuse. And Laugh and Sal, I'll riff on her for a second. She was in the fun house. She was in the corner in a glass booth. She was animated. I mean, literally, she moved. Uh, you know, ha, 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 laughing endlessly, waving her arms. And she was uh, pretty, pretty moth-eaten by the time Playland closed in 1972, but she was iconic. And somebody purchased her. Before they could get her out of the funhouse, somebody stole her head. And this brings up the question of what happened to Laughing Sal? Because her head went one direction and her body went another and her clothes were eventually reconstructed. There is no original laughing cell in, in one piece. In fact, there were about 120 or more laughing cells that were built. They were built by the Chicago Toboggan Company. They were a standard feature in amusement parks and carnivals. Uh, and she just happened to become the most famous. Where does she live today? That Well, the laughing cell that uh, is uh, seen most often is down at the Musi Mechanique, which is down at Fisherman's Wharf. The Musi Mechanique is a conglomeration of the coin operated machines, uh, fortune telling machines, uh, shooting gallery machines, the animatronic villages that come to life when you put a quarter in. A lot of these were displayed at Playland, and it, there was indeed a Musi Mechanique in Playland uh, in the 40s, 
and then it got moved up to Sutro uh, baths, and then it got moved to the basement of the cliff house. Every time it moved, machines got juggled and changed, and old ones uh, taken off and new ones were put in. And uh, when it got relocated down to Pier 45, they were able to uh, include quite a few artifacts from Playland at the Beach and from Sutro Baths, and it's still going strong, with the exception that in, in this weird 2020, we might remember that there was a huge fire uh, that burned Pier 45 at Fisherman's Wharf. Well, if you look there, Museum Mechanique is in Pier 45. Luckily, it was the far north end of this three block long pier shed that burned. The fire got to within 30 feet of the Muzi Mechanique collection. However, it, aside from smoke damage, it didn't damage any of the machines themselves. They've, they've been put back. Apparently, they're all ready to go as soon as they can open for business again under pandemic restrictions. Frontier Town, the mayor of Frontier Town was uh, the tall, lanky statue called Woody, who was on the roof of Frontier Town City Hall. He survived. He's been disarmed, and he's in the lobby of the Cliff House. If you go in for a drink, go right past him. The giant camera. This is what I mean by duck architecture. Uh, part of the Playland slash Disneyland was to take the old camera obscura, giant camera, make it actually look like a camera. And if you remember old brownie box cameras from the 1950s and 60s that you loaded with film, you had the two knobs that rolled the film uh, through the camera each time you took a picture. That was the idea of it being called the giant camera. I think it's a total misnomer now to anyone who thinks a camera is what resides in your iPhone, but this structure survived. It's the only part of Playland that survived. The only structure. Like I said, it was like an outlier from classic Playland at the beach, located behind the Cliff House. When the Cliff House was rehabilitated, they did a historic structure report on the entire building and its outbuildings. And it turned out the giant camera is so significant because of its association with Vanish Playland, because of its architecture, its technology. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's, um, it's protected. It's protected more than the actual cliff houses. And um, uh, to do this talk, I stand on the shoulder of giants, a guy named Tom Worsh, who made a documentary called uh, Playland at the Beach, a uh, full-length documentary with footage and color pictures, uh, interviews with staff who worked at Playland, and uh, James Smith, the historian who wrote two books about Playland at the Beach, The Early Years and The Golden Years. If you drive down from the Cliff House and you drive down Great Highway, next time you make that uh, roll downhill heading south and the Pacific unfolds on your right, on your left is condominium land, try to envision what was there? San Francisco's seaside playground, seaside destination, shoots at the beach, playland at the beach. Thanks for coming. And the last thing I want to do is formally say thank you to all the folks who uh, helped me uh, research and put together this show. So if, um, I'll be happy to answer it up for questions if anyone has any. Thank you, John. Uh, that was, as usual, uh, an unforgettable presentation. You made us feel like we, you know, you made us travel back in time, like like we were there uh, playing on the beach. I wish I was in San Francisco during that time. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't born yet. Yeah, but, I was gonna, um, I'm going to say, I think a lot of people, I'm dating myself here because I used to go there. I think a lot of people who joined us today have only heard of it. And it's one yeah. of those things that has become maybe like the Fox Theater or Sutro Bass, more famous in its absence than than in its reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 really like it was an incredible destination uh for, for locals, I can imagine. 
And I actually was curious about museum mechanique, if they were damaged by the fire or not. So I'm glad to hear that uh, they weren't affected. Um, that being said, I, uh, if, you, if you enjoy the presentation, uh, I have included John Martini uh, PayPal information at the beginning of the chat box and towards the end. Also, um, if you want to share his, your appreciation, you can uh, click on the link and um, share your uh, gratuities on, on his PayPal. We will also inclu include this link tomorrow on the YouTube uh, uh, recording. In the meantime, I have seen a couple of questions. Um, one from uh, Anita Rao. Anita. Anita, yeah, he, she asked, did the mural artwork on the exterior of the fun house survive? No, it was uh, just painted right on the, the clabbered siding. And uh, no, the, no one salvaged that. It just came right down. And to be frank, the, the great murals that you showed up in the old photos of, uh, oh, it's one of like a Toonerville trolley uh, cartoon, all that, those were gone uh, by the very end. These things were changed regularly as they weathered and as uh, times changed. No, what, what tended to be saved were the, were the smaller signs, something that you could uh, dismount and take with you. I see. Then I have seen uh, one regarding actually regarding the uh hold on one second i have a question on the chat box regarding the cliff house actually yeah. um did sam brennan own the first cliff house no uh, it's a uh, uh sam brennan uh may have had uh something to do with constructing that building called the seal rock house that uh, the very first structure that i showed the in a picture it was surrounded by sand dunes in 1858 mm -hmm. but no he had nothing to do with the cliff house that was uh, uh by a couple of other gentlemen they built it purely as a as a food concession as a destination in the 1860s what happens is that the histories out there get conflated because various buildings that went up at various times and sam brannan was such a great self-promoter for himself that uh, his name got associated with the cliff house just erroneously i see um then we have one from sharon um did a woody character uh, from frontier uh frontier town inspire woody in toy story actually it i uh, had the same kind of uh, flashback yeah i don't know um the, the similarities are amazing the you know, the, you know, the long lanky the, respected wearing a vest and everything else but the funny thing is is that woody was not on display at the time the toy story was made he was in storage somewhere so un unless they really did some deep research the, uh, the folks was at, at pixar and they had found a photo of woody at frontier town in the 60s and early 70s um it's a heck of it's a heck of a coincidence if, if they didn't okay next one is uh was this similar to the uh, great salt lake amusement area at the lake I, I can't really say i know there was a big one out on the shore of the lake and i think there was a big pavilion that was actually built out over the waters of the lake something like a uh, uh, big mosque or something but um, uh, I, I don't know what linkage there, there was, if any, between the two sites. So weird. I see. Now we have a few comments regarding their experiences, uh, memories um, of uh, attending, you know, going to play on the beach, not exactly questions. Well, I've seen a couple of references to Connie Island in, uh, you know, in, 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 Long Island, basically, uh, in Brooklyn, but I don't know if you want to add any uh, references between, you know, um, uh, Playland and the Beach and, and Coney Island. Only that uh, this was uh, San Francisco's scaled down version of Coney Island. Coney Island is, is a vast stretch out there. They, everything that we had, they did, they did bigger. 
at uh, Coney Island. Um, our rides, well, they hey, they were impressive for here, but Coney Island uh, was kind of on, on steroids. They, uh, but because that was like the yardstick you measured things by, we were the Coney Island of the West Coast. I see. Was well, if anyone else has um, questions, feel free to uh, write it on the chat box or uh, ask away. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask sure. directly to John. I will just say one last thing that I I really believe that if if Berlin at the beach was still open today, it would be really successful. I I have this feeling because you know uh, Santa Cruz is is his own amusement park, and I don't see why San Francisco right it shouldn't be uh, able to have his own today right so it's kind of sad yeah but um, I'll, 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 I'll tell you having grown out uh, grown up grown up out in that part of town <laughs> the weather is such a downer it mm. really really puts the clamp on uh, on, on going and, and hanging out at, at an amusement park i know santa cruz boy they're just going great guns because they've got great weather that's true yeah, you know, uh, April through uh, the end of October, whereas uh, days like this past weekend where you really want to head to the beach, pretty few and far between. Um, I'd like to think that it would it could be successful too. Um, but uh, it, anyway, we we know the saga of what was. But, oh, really quickly, like when I give tours, like out at Sutro Baths, or I, I give this show also as a PowerPoint, especially to younger audiences, uh, the people in their 20s, early 30s, especially those who moved here, they, they keep going, what happened to all these things? Why did they tear them down? You know, the, why is the Fox Theater gone? Why didn't they save the, the uh, Sutro's playland? It's almost like they think there was some giant conspiracy rid of all these cool things. And I keep telling them, follow the money. None of these things were making money. And that's what it comes down to, and especially in the 60s, before we had a strong really strong preservation ethic in the city. We did some things that were almost unthinkable. Um, uh, tearing down the Fox Theater. Actually, the people of San Francisco got to vote on a bond issue, whether or not to buy it as a performing arts center. And they turned it down. And so the building was demolished. Sucrose is just, it was a giant building that was ramshackle and wasn't making money. And like Playland, build condos. Luckily, uh, Sucrose stayed undeveloped. Um, the site of Playland's gone forever. I'm I'm just curious, like those amusement, like those attraction, were they making money because of maintenance costs or because there were not too many people riding them? Uh, not too many riding them. The okay. uh, the like I said, the, where you made the money were like the games of chance and the uh, and the food, um, but the big rides they took maintenance. If the crowds weren't there, weren't riding on them. They weren't paying for themselves. It becomes mighty attractive just to say, "What what else can we do with this real estate?" Yeah, the uh, and I I come back too to what I said about we got more mobile. We didn't we weren't restricted to taking a streetcar to go to see amusement park. We could drive places, uh, and the giant amusement parks, um, Marine World Africa USA, when it was down Redwood City, that was coming online at the at the last days of, of Playland, Great America. Um, Playland was just, it was it was old and it was outmoded. People were going other places. Yeah. Okay, any other question for? Uh, Robert, Robert. Okay. I just want to say, don't forget, John, television was coming into its own, and that had a lot to do with people watching instead of doing. Um, okay, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, but the oh, I, grew, I grew up at Playland. I was there all the time with the fun house and the diving bell and the roller coaster and the hot house. I mean, I was... I'm a native, and I was there until I ten, turned 10 years old, so I spent a lot of time there. But it felt like at the end, it was really people were staying home and watching television. Hmm. I, I, we, this is something maybe, maybe to be discussed over uh, uh, over a cup of coffee, because <laughs> okay. my, my impression is that 
uh, the golden age of television and the golden in the early 50s and the golden age of Playland were simultaneous. Um, the, uh, and, and the, the best programming came on at, uh, at night. But, it, but that, that's a good thought. Let me, uh, let me chew on that one. Okay, John, you're on. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> All right. Um, I see another comment by Kathy. Um, she well, she was she. I think she's she's um, saying something more about the distance that uh, it was so far away. If you grew up in San Jose, for example, uh, she was not supposed to drive so far, but uh, she was doing anyway with, with friends. So I guess also people from the Bay Area didn't want to come all the way to the west part of the city. Maybe I don't know. That's hmm. that's also a possibility. If you if you were growing up down in San Jose, it was a, it was a lot closer to drive over to to Santa Cruz too. I really yeah. wasn't supposed to drive that road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, Helen, you want to add anything? I see Helen is is there I online. Saw Helen pop up there. Hi, I'm so sorry. I want. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I am just so excited to see the uh, presentation. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be on here for the last minute um, appointment I had to take care of, but uh, th this has just been a mysterious place for me the whole time that I've lived here in San Francisco and been able to get listen to the pieces of it because I know I would have loved it. So, John, thank you so much for taking everyone down memory lane and always just being so awesome with us and giving these great presentations. You rock. <laughs> hey, hey, John. John, Yo. this is Paul Hartstone. I grew up kind of in the same era, too. Uh, yeah. And what, what you brought back was uh, the memories of the hothouse. Now, I remember the hothouse, and I really did think it was Mexican food, okay? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, at one point, I think it moved around the corner to Balboa. I don't know if it's, is it still there as far as you know? Uh, no. no, it okay. closed down, and uh, but it's reemerged. The family still opens in period as, as like a pop-up. Uh, oh. Yeah, they're the little little hazy on all the details here, but periodically you hear about the hot house is going to reopen uh, for a, a, a period of several weeks. And uh, I used I used using to the same, uh, I, uh, recipe. Our our family used to enjoy their. Um, it was um, Mexican rice or Spanish rice and and sliced chicken was one of the dishes, yes. and the other and the other yes. one was they had a uh, what do you call it um, the stomach um, um, try it hmm? try 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 tripe yeah try Sp Spanish tripe was another dish they had there so mm. you brought back you brought back uh, memories for me there there's a yeah a lot we of also have memories too of you go down there and you you bring a, a a baking pan your own pan and uh -huh. uh, yes. load it up with tamales and uh, cover with brown paper and tie it up with string yeah and, uh, yes dad or yes. mom bringing home tamales from the hot house oh wonderful john i have to share with you that i actually experienced Playland at the beach before I ever really knew about it. And that was in 2005 at the Burning Man Festival in their man base underneath the man, they had a fun house, like a circus tent. And in mm -hmm. the front of it, they had oh. one of the laughing sows. And did. so you oh. would just hear laughing sow when you went up riding your bike around the man base in the playa. And I was like, what is this? And my friend was like, this is from Playland at the beach in San Francisco. And that it was one of the times when I started like discovering San Francisco. So I uh, he told told me all about it out of out of Burning Man. That's when I first found out of Playland at Playland at the Beach. I don't know if you were well, here for it, but there were uh, dozens and dozens of laughing sows uh, constructed mm -hmm. uh, for for midways and carnivals across the country. And the laughing sow from Playland, somebody uh, got her head and uh, absconded with it uh, b before the guy who purchased it could get her off site. So th th this has generated endless discussion among San Francisco historians of, of where did the real laughing South parts end up? Wow. And um, the, uh, the, the, the laughing cell that you see when you go to Musée Mechanique apparently was a backup 
they had one in the uh, in the back warehouse in case the one in the fun house you know did a face plant someday um and so the one they have down there uh, danny uh, Zelinsky will say it's the backup sal whereas the one that was actually down there her parts are gone with the wind wow i think her head is down at santa cruz she lost her head in santa cruz <laughs> <laughs> well since uh, john you said that uh, closing day was uh, the day after labor day in 1972 so we could say that today is the 48th anniversary of the the closure of playland of the beach right yeah except that i think it was september 5th was the day after labor day oh, okay. then september 5th okay yeah yeah but the, the weird thing is is that playland at the beach existed as playland let's mm -hmm. say from uh, uh, uh 1922 when the the roller coaster went up and, and shoots was up till 1950 years so it's been gone almost as long as it existed i see all right so i think uh we had a successful mini meeting uh, and presentation this will also be on our youtube page for and we will share it with everyone else that wasn't able to attend the presentation today so um thank you again john it was it was really great um and until the next uh, the next martini tuesdays Hi. <laughs> yeah thank you john thank you, thank you, thank you john. John. talking thank to you guys you i get i get lonely <laughs> <laughs> We love you. We're here for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone much. for attending. Bye bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank, thank everyone. you. Thank you very Be much. Safe, everyone. Stay well. I'm going to go to a corner store and get an It's It ice cream. <laughs> That's it.